Okay, let's start. Hi everyone, welcome back to our 11th C++ programming lecture. So today we are going to talk about two things. Um, first of all, we are going to talk about libraries. So what uh, useful C++ libraries there are out in the wild. And also I give you um, some examples and an overview on what those libraries uh, can do for you in practice. So you might, uh, depending on the field you are working in, um, you might you might find a, a useful library that you are interested in, and yeah, at home you can try try out that library and um, make good use of it. And um, a second point for today, we are going to discuss about iterators. So what um, are iterators? How can they be used, and um, why it is hard to write your own iterator? So that's what we are discussing about today. So libraries. Um, first of all, why should you bother with libraries anyway? So uh, why don't you just um, solve the problem or solve a given problem on your own? <clears throat> what's, what's the purpose of a library? And that really boils down to the question, yeah, why should, why should you solve a task that has already been solved by other people? Um, and yeah, by using libraries, it's mostly about uh, reuse. So uh, don't waste your time really and uh, just make use of a good library. So if you would handcraft everything you need uh, from scratch really, that would be a huge waste of time and also a waste of energy. Um, also, you cannot solve all tasks. Um, there are just too many of them um, you, <laughs> and you only have a finite amount of, of, of lifetime. <laughs> so you can't really solve all problems in the world. And um, for, for that reason, you sometimes just need to um, fall back um, to libraries, really. And um, some tasks are really just too hard, such that you uh, can't solve them. Maybe you are not an expert in that particular field. Um, there are lots and lots of people who are much clearer than I am. So, and um, I reckon they are also able to write better libraries in a certain domain for a certain area. So I would rather use um, those people's library than trying to craft my own solutions. Uh, speaking about libraries, this is a very beautiful library here at uh, Melk Abbey in Austria. So if you ever uh, come to Austria, you might wish to visit uh, that library. Um, in general, <coughs> so usually much effort and, and clever design has been put into libraries. So uh, libraries are developed over a large time span, quite, clever de quite cleverly designed usually and um, also usually easy to use. Um, if you have the choice, um, and if it's possible, try to prefer the STL over other third-party libraries. Um, that only sounds reasonable. Um, be very sure to always use high-quality libraries. So even if you can't use the STL, because maybe there is no STL implementation for your platform you are developing for, um, or whatnot. Um, so if you ever need to use an, exter uh, an external third-party library, um, try to make sure that uh, it is of good quality. And always prefer libraries over some ad hoc uh, handcrafted solutions. Yeah, I already mentioned that. That um, should be very important. Let's now talk about some libraries that you can and probably should at some point use, really. So the first library that comes to our mind probably is the STL, the standard template library that comes with the C++ programming language. So the STL contains a huge amount of useful things. We already made uh, quite good use of it. Um, <clears throat> we have been making use of container types so far. We used vectors, we used strings, we used, uh, what else did we use, map. Um, so we used many of those container types. We, we used I/O stream such that we can um, get some input and output from and uh, uh, to and from our programs. Um, in the last exercise sheet, probably you worked on file streams, right? So reading and writing data from file. And also in the next lecture, which will be about high-performance computing, 
we will also see that the SDL provides means to um, describe computations such that they can run in parallel. So you also have some thread libraries within the SDL, or some thread library within the SDL that you can, can use for that. Um, we will discuss all the details in the next lecture. Um, the SDL is specified by the C++ standardization committee, so um, quite clever people are working on it and um, trying to make it um, uh, well usable. And different compiler vendors provide different implementations. So usually <coughs> a compiler vendor not only provides the plain C++, uh, plain C++ compiler, but um, also they provide their own STL implementation. For instance, in GCC, the STL implementation would be called libstud C++, and in Clang, it would be called libc++. So if you use the find program on your, uh, on your Unix Linux machine, you can grab for those library names, and um, yeah, it, it, those libraries are somewhere on your system, depending whether you have installed GCC or Clang. And also the good thing about the SDL is that it is automatically linked with your application. So if you write some C++ code, if you use some container types or whatnot, um, if it's not anyways all defined as a header file, um, it will automatically link against by the C++ compiler. So that's quite nice. You don't have to worry, worry about anything really. Uh, yeah, if possible, uh, try to prefer STL over some other third-party libraries. The STL library, and also that pretty much holds for all of C++'s library, usually at least, um, so they are always optimized for performance and um, for usability, um, hopefully usability, but at least uh, in all cases they are um, uh, <coughs> optimized for performance. And uh, so usually you can be pretty sure that your code will run fast, um, even though you are using some libraries, which on the other end makes it sometimes hard to read for humans. So if you, for instance, have a look at the STL implementation, which you can do, obviously. I mean, all those header files like IO stream vector, they are installed on your computer somewhere in your systems um, directories. So you can just uh, search for them, look for them, and um, have a look at the code, really. Um, it looks hugely complicated because those files have been yeah, highly optimized, those uh, sources, and they have basically been written to be readable for the compiler rather than the humans. Um, but luckily, uh, once you have um, written a library or once a library has been written and has been uh, debugged and optimized, then you usually just need to use the library. You don't have to um, read the code. That's, the, that's basically the point, right? So you have to just use the library. Um, sometimes you run into trouble. For instance, if you um, maybe, for instance, need to uh, implement some stuff for platforms like PlayStation or Xbox, um, some of those platforms do not offer an SDL implementation. And then you are left um, on your own again. Um, so also be aware that um, there might exist no uh, C++, uh, no SDL implementation for a specific platform. So if, if it's a more exotic platform, for instance. And also very important to recognize, so the SDL is not perfect to solve every task. So depending on your domain and the problems you're working on, you might still wish to use another library um, and you wish to prefer another library over the STL. So, I mean, the STL is implemented for all purpose uh, computations, so to say. So it must be good at every at any job. Um, but if you have a very particular job to solve, then you maybe wish to use uh, some more specialized library which, which uh, use, uh, uses domain knowledge to even further optimize for performance. So um, yeah, that's that's very important. So SDL is by mo by no means uh, perfect, and um, it's also not uh, the correct library for for every job. We will have I, I will mention that on one slide later on, and this is 
a quite important point. Um, so um, yeah, I will refer back to this slide when I'm when I'm when I'm there really. And also, <laughs> of course, C++ would not be C++ if you um, wouldn't have those nice error messages uh, whenever you fiddle around with templates. So, uh, and if you do something wrong, the compiler will throw uh, an ugly error at you, <laughs> mostly at least. <clears throat> so that uh, would be um, pretty much all about SCL so far. Um, and what other libraries um, is, uh, can be used in C++? I mean Boost, for instance. Boost is a well-known C++ library. It was also funded, uh, founded by the C++ standardization committee members. So it's pretty much a collection of uh, portable sub-libraries. So first of all, the great thing is portable. So if you write uh, some program and if you make uh, use of the Boost library, you can then compile your program on a Linux Unix system and it will work. You can also um, translate your source on a Windows machine. It will also work. It will, would still work. And you can also uh, recompile on Mac and it hopefully still also works. Um, so portability is really an important factor and uh, Boost um, takes care of portability. So once you've written your project, it should be compilable and runnable on all those different op operating systems, for instance. Um, and sub-libraries, because Boost is not one library just, but it's more kind of a library collection. So it um, it offers certain sub-libraries for algorithms, for graphs, for network connections. Um, so pretty much everything that you could ever need really as a programmer. So yeah, I just mentioned that. So sub-libraries are distinguished by the task to solve. Uh, most parts of these libraries are implemented in header files, so because they are making use of templates. And as you already know, template code can't be compiled up front. And that is why a template code um, goes in header files. And um, <coughs> most parts of Boost are implemented as header only files. So you don't really have to compile. Um, uh, the Boost library, or at least only parts of it. Um, for most of the time, you're just including a Boost header file, and then you can just 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 use those functionalities that the header file provides and implements. And one specialty also, the uh, file endings of of the Boost header only implementations are uh, .hpp. Uh, why is that? Yeah, I just mentioned that because of templates, you can't compile them up front. It's also highly compatible with uh, the STL, which is uh, great, I guess. Um, so that's good news. It's heavily used by all C++ programmers of all domains. So I myself use it. And uh, I mean, if you ask a C++ programmer or a real C++ developer, he at some point will have, um, he, he probably will have um, used Boost already. So um, it's quite common to use it. A very high quality, so if some guy decides, yeah, I would like to uh, implement my own library, that's of course possible. And if you then, for instance, wish to try to submit your library into uh, the Boost library collection, um, it has to undergo an extensive review process. <laughs> um, there has been a saying, I I'm not sure if it's true, can also be, uh, but, but it could be true. So the saying um, says really there have been more people on the moon than uh, people submitted a library to the Boost library collection. So uh, <laughs> not sure about that, but um, it comes pretty close, I guess, even if um, more people have submitted rather than people being on the moon. And I already said that it's not restricted to a specific domain, so it, it provides lots and lots of useful functionalities. The overall goal of the project is just to increase productivity, <coughs> such that you don't have to um, reinvent the wheel and have to do every single little task on your own. Just call uh, the library functions to solve a certain task. Um, Boost also has uh, suitable licenses for commercial and also non-commercial use, which is also very important if you become a software developer or software engineer later on, uh, that might also be of importance to you. 
I mean, as a student, usually you don't care what uh, license a product has, uh, you just use it anyway. Anyways, but um, if you then work for a larger company, you have to be sure that you um, don't mess around with all the licenses. Otherwise, yeah, you can get into huge trouble. Um, using Boost and other libraries in general, uh, yeah, Boost is huge library collections. You cannot look things up. Um, you cannot look things up manually because um, even the Boost library is, is too large and you don't have all the time to, to read all the code of the Boost library and then manually check um, what it can do, what, what functionalities it can provide for you. So which is usually what you do is you just use Google, right? So and then you specify something like yeah C++, what you want to do and what library uh, you, you wish to use really. For instance, yeah, C++ serialized objects, Boost or using Boost and then usually, <clears throat> I mean, you, you know how to use Google probably. Um, and uh, then you would uh, look for what, what looks promising really. Uh, my recommendation is, however, never use code blindly. So do not just copy what you find on Stack Overflow or some other um, website and paste it into your code, compile and run it. Because um, if you don't know what the code does, it could ruin your system because there might be some troll who uh, who um, offers some code that, I don't know, uh, erases your whole file system. That's probably not um, what you wish to run on your system. So. Look what's promising, then try to read the code, try to understand what it does. Um, if it looks good, um, that's also um, a very important um, skill that you need to learn. So you have to be able to learn to distinguish good code from rubbish code. And unfortunately, there's also much uh, rubbish out there. And um, you need to learn about how to tell the difference, really. And what you can always do before you're integrating some piece of code in your large project, if, if you ever need to write a large project, um, it's oftentimes advisable to write some small test programs or um, write some unit tests. So I will also present in this lecture library um, called gtest, which you can use for um, writing unit tests in C++. So usually you start off with writing some small test programs to, to test and um, um, develop individual features and then you integrate those features into your larger larger software project. And in terms of code, there's also much rubbish out there on the internet. So always go for high quality resources um, rather than probably some blog posts most of the time. Or at least if you have a look at blog posts, they also offer um, good solutions oftentimes, but uh, you then have to check uh, for yourself if, if that is good code or if that is rubbish code. Um, now I'm going to present some of Boost's uh, sub-libraries, um, which may be useful to you at some point. But um, of course, Boost has so many sub-libraries, I, I can't present them all. I, I just present some uh, which, which came to my mind <coughs> while preparing uh, the lecture slides here. So what might be useful is a Boost file system. Um, Especially because it's um, yeah, Boost is platform independent. So when you implement some stuff, it will work on um, Windows, uh, Mac, and also Unix Linux systems. So if you wish to use uh, Boost file system functionalities, yeah, you just need to include uh, boost slash file system dot hpp, and then you are ready to go. Uh, first of all, we um, wish to introduce some kind of uh, namespace abbreviation. So rather than having to type the uh, prefix, the namespace prefix here, boost, colon, colon, file system, colon, colon, whatever you wish to use, um, we use a shorthand, uh, BFS, for boost file system. And what could we do? We could, for instance, use, uh, use a path, P. Um, so path is obviously then a type which has been implemented by the boost file system. Um, we can access this by the prefix BFS, which we just um, introduced here. And here we can specify a directory and then p is a path pointing to uh, the files directory. We can also have a path q which um, yeah, points basically to a, a file, a text file in this case, data.txt. 
Um, the operators also have been overloaded, so you could also write some code. If you have two paths, really, and one is a directory and the other one is a file, you can just write um, p slash q, and it will, r will then, it will then be the path uh, file slash data txt. Um, you can also convert the path back to a string and print it with the command line. You can check if um, a path exists. Here you can use the boost file system method exists, um, which gives a path and then it will return true or false depending on whether that is a valid path or it isn't. You can also check if a, a, a thing really is a directory. If it isn't a directory, it's probably a file. I mean, what, what else is left? So it is a file if it's not a directory. You can ask uh, for the stem, which would be in, in our case data. And you can also explicitly ask for the extension, which would be .txt. Yeah, and by using the boost file system library, you don't have to manually iterate over the, the path names and you have to pass what, what is the stem, what is the extension. And so, I mean, it's just much more convenient to use and, and um, much easier to read. You can also iterate the contents of a directory. Here we just use a plain while loop. There are probably better ways to do it, but that's what I found on the internet. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, how you could use the boost file system sublibrary. Um, another very important library, sublibrary of boost is um, probably program options. You might also wish to use the program option sublibrary for your final project um, at the very end of this um, course. And it allows you to interact with the command line. So many times if you write a C++ project, you don't wish to um, implement a graphical application. So many times a command line application is completely sufficient. But then you're also left with the task that you at some point set, uh, need to set up some parameters such that you can interact with your program. Usually you don't just wish to run your program like dot slash and then your program's name. But oftentimes you also need to provide some additional options. And maybe you need to give it some file names and you maybe need to um, give it some other command line flags and, and, and options uh, via the command line. And um, this can all be managed by the boost program options, which is uh, quite nice to use. So uh, in case you ever need that, you need to include a boost slash program options dot HPP. Again, we use a, a shorthand here, um, BPO for boost program options. And let, let us have an example. So an example how you could uh, manage the command line would be as follows. Uh, you can go on the internet and look um, how it uh, can be done in detail here. This is just a small example that, um, to, sh to, to show you how it generally works. Mm. So <clears throat> you create first of all a variables map, um, um, which we call var map for variables map. Um, you can create a description for the command line options. Um, just give it some some string here, my awesome program. And then uh, to those uh, options here, to those um, options description, you can then add descriptions. So you take the, the variable options and so you add some options. Here, for instance, you specify the command line flags. So the long command line flag would be num. Uh, you could also use the shorthand uppercase n, um, which should be of type integer. And then you can also add a description how those uh, how this parameter should be used and, and what it does, basically. Um, here, we don't provide any meaningful description in this example. But um, if you do it for real, you should, of course, provide a meaningful description. We also introduce a second parameter, a second command line option, which we call message, uh, msg, and also we have a shorthand for that, uh, uppercase M. We specify the type to be a std string. We also say that it is a multi-token and whatnot. You can look up what those uh, options mean on the internet, and then also we give it a description. Um, then what we are doing now is we um, use the uh, boost program options command line parser, give it the um, arguments of the program, the command line arguments, and um, <clears throat> try to try to pass those um, according to the options that we specified right here. And uh, yeah, then we run our parser. 
and we store whatever has been passed here in the variables map. And then we can also notify our variables map to do some parameter checking, but uh, that's not really important here. And of course, because um, the command line flags are not under your, under your control really, so if something goes wrong here while trying to pass the command line arguments um, of your program, a boost can also throw an exception. So you have to uh, wrap that around, try and catch. Um, and at the very end, so first of all, we can then have some error handling. We can check if the argument counter is just one, basically the program's name. That means that um, the user hasn't provided any additional arguments and we just print out the options. So options can be printed and then it will be printing my awesome program. And also with, it will print you a nice format of all the allowed options here. Uh, and otherwise, if we have registered, successfully registered some um, command line flags, we can now then ask the variables map um, for those values. So we can check, uh, does the variable map uh, contain um, an argument called number? If it does, we can access the number argument here and we can get it back as integer as we specified here. So we then have to get it back as an integer. Same thing holds for message. We can then ask the variables map, hey, uh, if you have registered a message, give me that message as a string. Um, so, so here the types that we put in. So those types have to match. Uh, and then you can do stuff with it and implement your logic based on the um, arguments given by the, by the user. So that might be very interesting to you. <coughs> Also, there is a logger in Boost. So um, if you have um, a long running application, which um, can be tricky or hard to debug, you might wish to use a logger at some point. Um, this is how it could be done. Again, you need to look up all the details on the internet, of course. Um, what could we do? For instance, we could first of all create a severity level. So we have uh, different kinds of messages. So uh, just an info, a debug, warning, error, critical. Um, this is a macro here, which would, uh, which allows you to introduce a logger to your system. Then you can have some initializer function. I don't explicitly uh, go through all lines here, but you can register different backends to your logger. So basically you can uh, just print it out to the command line such that each uh, log line is, is printed to the command line. You can also register a different backend, so to say you can uh, therefore register a file such that all the uh, logging messages are written to a file or, or whatnot. So it, it provides really a huge amount of um, flexibility. You can also have a formatter and uh, introduce a formatter which uh, formats all of your logging lines. And then you could use it, of course. You could, uh, could run your initialized logger function, which sets up the overall logger. And then you can uh, log stuff. Yeah? You can get your logger, set the severity level, and then you can print some messages to it. And uh, what you're going to use is you use a macro here, boost log and then severity. Um, severity is uh, this level here. Um, and the great thing is you can also completely disable the logger. So because it's a macro and you finally ship your code, you can um, just um, remove that line, not by hand, but rather by using the preprocessor. Uh, so the boost log Ceph macro will just be replaced by nothing, by emptiness. <coughs> and then the compiler <coughs> does not see the logging lines. So that's a new trick. So you can use a nice logger for developing your application. And then finally, before you ship it, you can just um, have a compile um, with uh, a disabled logger and then you have your uh, full performance basically. Ah, here are the include files here. You, for the logger example, you need uh, some more include files. But um, again, if you ever need to use that, you can look it up. Um, also, for time reasons, I can't present all of the Boost sub-libraries uh, to you. Um, there are many more. Um, check if Boost can solve your problems and you should probably go for it. Um, you find the Boost documentation here. And there's also a nice hands-on tutorial guide by some consultant. Um, the web page is called the Boost C++ libraries. Um, so you find um, 
extensive guide on how to use the Boosty++ libraries. Probably this second um, material here is even more understandable than the original Boost um, documentation, <laughs> at least that is uh, my experience. And also the second thing here comes, comes with uh, lots and lots of um, easy to read, uh, easy to understand code examples. So you can then walk, uh, work your way from there, I guess. So what, what else do we have? We also have a library called Qt, um, Qt. Um, so you can pronounce it Qt or Qt, uh, both is possible. It's uh, also a platform independent, platform independence is always a great thing. Uh, it's always a good thing. So it's a platform independent C++ class library and the primary goal of that Qt library is um, being able or providing functionalities to implement some graphical applications. So it's, it's about graphical user interfaces really. So it supports the X11 server on Linux, um, um, Unix, uh, OS X, uh, Windows. You can also write some iOS and Android apps using Qt. So nowadays you can also write uh, apps in C++ really. Um, it covers also other domains. Um, that means um, I'm aware that there are some network connection functionalities. So you can communicate over the network. Um, um, yeah, one specialty maybe about Qt is that it comes with a mock preprocessor. So um, the library comes with a meter object compiler, which allows for signals, slots, and reflections. So if you don't know what signals and slots are, um, don't worry. If you ever have to do some graphical stuff here, um, you just need to look it up anyways. And uh, if, uh, it takes some time, of course, to get uh, used to it and familiarize yourself with it. Uh, it also provides interfaces for other languages. Um, if I recall correctly, you can also write some Python programs which uses Qt or some stuff like that, um, if you ever uh, would like to do that. Um, a recommendation if you need to write some Qt application, especially for writing graphical user interfaces or graphical interfaces in general, you probably wish to use the IDE that Qt offers. So Qt offers its own IDE, which is called uh, Qt Creator. So it's an integrated development environment and you should, um, whenever you do some graphical stuff with Qt, you should prefer that IDE over some other text editors. Um, because uh, on, on, on uh, very important here, it also includes a GUI designer. So um, what you can do is you can, of course, write in code, yeah, my window should be of that and that size and it should behave as follows. So you can, of course, all do that in program code. But that's very tedious. So that's really, really painful. And I'm, I'm also one of the guys who thinks that graphical programming is, is a nightmare and um, mostly rubbish, really. Um, but luckily there's a GUI designer. So that means your uh, Qt's IDE provides a GUI designer, which is a graphic, graphical application in itself. And then you can drag and drop windows. So you can just create a new window and then you can drag it to uh, the proper size and it will then generate the code for you, which is great. So you don't have to fiddle around with uh, nasty windows yourself. You can just uh, click a GUI together and it will generate the C++ code for that. Um, which is awesome. Um, yeah, you, you really wish to use Qt Creator when developing Qt applications. And here would be one example. This is a Qt Creator. So uh, you have an application, a Qt application. You can create a main window and you say, yeah, please show me that window. And then you have a hello world window. So that's a small example to give you an idea how it works. Um, for more details, uh, you just have to look stuff up. What else do we have? We also have, a, uh, and by the way, I used probably all of those libraries in my career so far, which is also why I'm going to present those to you because I can give you some first-hand experience here. Um, another um, library that I used in my master thesis is the Armadillo library. It's a high quality linear algebra library. So you can do some math um, computations, some mathematical computations. And it's, it's really a good balance between performance and ease of use. Um, 
So it, it's really easy to use and if it gives you decent performance. It provides some high level syntax. We will have some examples on the right hand side in just a few seconds. Um, it can be used for machine learning, for pattern recognition. You can also um, uh, use it for computer vision, some computations, signal processing in general, bioinformatics, so basically pretty much all stuff um, where you use lin linear algebra mostly. Um, and algorithms can be really easily implemented by using the Amadillo library. So you can um, just write algorithms like in math textbooks really, which uh, is really nice, really readable. Uh, and also the documentation is really good. Um, and it, it includes lots of useful examples. So let's have some example code on the right hand side. So you need to include Amadillo, the um, header file of that library. We can also use the namespaces here. Let's use namespace std and let's also use namespace armor. That's the uh, namespace of the Amadillo library. So we can create a matrix of a random uh, numbers here, three times three. And uh, mat is just uh, a shorthand. It's just a type alias for give me a matrix of doubles because matrix of double is so common that there is a shorthand mat. Matrix A, matrix B, just fill in with some random numbers. And then we can just provide a specified matrix multiplication here. So this does uh, A times B, and it gives you the result, um, which is a matrix C. What else do we have? So and you, then you can also print the result to the command line. So also the output stream operator has been overloaded for you. You can also do much more complicated stuff because, um, for instance, if you have a matrix, um, which cannot be, how was it in mathematics? It, it was like, if you have a matrix which can't be diagonalized, you can't compute its inverse. So uh, a matrix um, which can't be diagonalized um, does not have an inverse, uh, which applies for the matrix D here. Um, but what there is in mathematics, and that's the point why I used Amadillo in my uh, master thesis, I had to compute at some point the Moore-Penrose inverse, because um, the Moore-Penrose inverse is some kind of cheat, um, which, which, uh, can you, which you can use as an inverse for matrices, which usually can't be inverted. And luckily, um, Luckily, uh, the Amadillo library provides just a simple functionality. So you provide your matrix, you specify your matrix, and you call the uh, Penrose inverse, and then you have your result done. So I also thought of implementing that myself, such that I do not have to use that library, but um, I looked at the math textbook and uh, computing the Moore Penrose inverse in uh, specifying it in a computer programming language. It turns out to be really hard, and uh, why should I do it if there already is a library for that? So I just use that uh, library and it worked, worked perfectly fine here. So give it a try if you ever need to do something like that. What else is left? We also have OpenCV, which is um, uh, Open C++ library for computer vision, so CB for computer vision. Uh, in German it uh, is uh, Bildverarbeitung. So it's a high quality C++ library for computer vision. It's, um, it's being used in academia, but also it's heavily used in industry. So it's, it's of really good quality. It's also implemented as efficient as possible. It allows for real-time applications as well. So probably if you buy a new car, like say a Tesla or whatnot, uh, shows your favorite, favorite brand, and um, maybe it also has some kind of limited autopilot functionalities. Uh, it has usually a camera in the center, which takes some pictures and then it tries to figure out where the road is. Uh, hopefully it does so correctly. Um, and probably there runs OpenCV on those uh, systems um, for image um, detection, um, for, for road detection and, and all the good stuff because it's just plain um, computer vision. Yeah, it's all optimized C++ code, so it runs uh, very uh, efficient. It also has support for multi-core and uh, GPUs. So that is, uh, if you have a GPU, so many codes have been designed that they detect whether you have a GPU, and if they can run on GPU, they 
they will run on GPU rather than on your um, ordinary uh, central processing unit CPU. Lots of useful stuff. So you can do a Fourier, uh, Fourier transformation, which is really a pain to implement. So I would not be willing to implement that myself. So luckily there exists such library here. Um, also some classification engines. So there's a support vector machine where you can uh, have an image and then it will, you give it some parameters, some feature vectors and all the good stuff. You train it a bit and then it tells you, yeah, cat or dog. So that uh, would be what a support vector machine can do. So do some classification. Um, edge detection can be done and all that good stuff. It also provides some graphical user interface elements. So you can also have some, some windows that you can draw on the uh, screen. So here would be a very simple example. So you just um, include OpenCV2 core, core.hpp, some, some other header file. And for instance, you could read a picture and you can also then show the picture. That is the picture called Lina and it's basically the hello world of um, computer vision researchers. Um, that's the picture that they analyze as a hello world usually. And um, yeah, then you can call a function called wait key and it will show you the image until you press any key and then it will um, basically disappear. So the structure, data structure in which you read an image is called also a matrix. So you, you would also be able, and I did that um, myself as well, you could also then iterate all the pixels of uh, the picture. You could read the RGB values, you could uh, fiddle around with them, you could uh, write algorithms which uh, do some filtering and all that good stuff. But you could also, of course, use the existing, the many existing filters of the OpenCV library. And if you wish to uh, perform a discrete Fourier transformation on uh, this picture, it would just be a few more lines of code, but uh, very easy. What else do we have? We also have the Open Graphics Library, which is called nowadays in the newer version Vulkan. Um, so it's an API for 2D and 3D computer graphics applications. So it means you could um, implement your own 2D or 3D games with that. So maybe you could implement GTA uh, 6 or whatnot or whatever uh, things you're interested in. So this would be the library to, to do it, to implement some nice computer games. Um, it's also platform independent, which is really great. It provides real-time rendering mechanisms of complex 3D scenes, um, which, which is then done on graphics cards. Um, modern computer games can be programmed, yeah, in OpenGL or Vulkan. Um, nowadays it's called Vulkan, already said that. So this is the logo, if you wonder how the logo looks like. Um, animated movies, for instance, from Pixar or Disney or whatnot, um, those are usually done by something which is called ray tracing which is somewhat different from uh, the computer graphics rendering pipeline. So because um, ray tracing, ray tracing is a technique that allows you to generate photorealistic images. So images where you can't tell the difference between reality and um, yeah, uh, basically um, artificially generated pictures. Um, but this is currently too slow for graphics cards for real-time uh, computations, unfortunately. But um, hopefully where things speed up, at some point we will have also some games um, which do ray tracing. Um, that would be awesome, really. <coughs> Here also give you some code example. You should be able to plug that in into your favorite IDE. Save that file, run that file, uh, of course, um, the prerequisite is that you install the library and then it will um, show you um, a window where it uh, prints, where it draws some nice green triangle because uh, why wouldn't you? What else do we have? Um, OpenCL or what was CL for? I can't recall what CL is for. Uh, copy, mm -hmm. Not sure. Anyway. Look it up. <laughs> Let's discuss about OpenCL and CUDA. Um, 
So OpenCL is open source. Uh, CUDA is basically um, NVIDIA's closed source OpenCL version. I, it's, it's somewhat different than OpenCL, but um, uh, the theoretical concept is uh, pretty much the same. Um, for CUDA, you would use the NVIDIA C, C++ compiler, which is called NVCC. Um, let's have some, this is some CUDA code because I also used it in my master thesis. Um, where I had to do some computations on a graphics card. So let's have a small example where we do some vector addition on a graphics card. So let's introduce a function called vector addition. Um, if we put that magical keyword global in front of it, we basically denote that this is a, that this is a function which is um, computed on the graphics card here really. And here, what is vector addition? We give it two vectors a and b, and here I prefixed a and b with a def for device, because uh, this stuff should happen on a device, on a graphics card. So we have two input vectors a and b, and the sum should be stored in def c, and then, yeah, we just do vector addition. Um, so in a graphics card, you have a gazillion number of cores and also a gazillion number of threads. So uh, each thread of a GPU has its own thread ID, which you can use. And then you can basically ha have each thread do its own computation. So each thread does one, the, does, does the addition of one place in your array. So def A at the position thread ID plus def B at the position thread ID um, is the result, which you then store in uh, def C at the position thread ID. So you have some errors on your host machine. This is usually the ordinary computer's main memory. <clears throat> so let's have three arrays, A, B, and C. So A and B do contain some numbers and then C is where the result should go. Then you need some pointers because you now next, you also need to allocate some memory on the GPU. So the GPU's memory is different from the uh, main random access memory on your machine. That means you also need to do some allocation on the um, graphics card. So which in CUDA you use CUDA malloc. So you allocate some data on the uh, graphics card. Uh, let's initialize the host data with uh, some, I don't know, with some arbitrary data such that we have some data in it. <laughs> What you now do is after you have allocated um, memory on the GPU, you are now copying the data of your host system, which is stored in those arrays, onto the or into the um, arrays that you just allocated on the graphics card. So you copy memory from host to device. Um, <clears throat> then you call your vector addition kernel. It uh, takes some magic arguments, which I won't go into detail here. You need to look it up whenever you need to use it. Um, you provided the corresponding parameters here. And finally, you copy your result back from the device onto your host. And then you have your result. You can print your result uh, to the command line and also you eventually need to free the memory that has been allocated on the graphics card. That's pretty much how it works. Um, nowadays, you don't need to copy to and from GPU RAM explicitly. Here I did it. So I allocate it, I copy it back and forth, and then I deallocate it. And nowadays, um, CUDA has improved, and uh, this happens implicitly, which is a great thing because you avoid um, lots and lots of boilerplate code. Um, what is OpenCL? And the same basic may also holds for CUDA. So it's an open standard for all graphics cards, accelerated multi-core architectures. That means you can describe computations in such a way <coughs> that they can run on some um, special accelerated multi-core architectures uh, like graphics card, for example. There are also some non-graphics cards, multi-core architectures. So uh, for instance, Intel offers some um, Phi co-processors, which um, yeah, give you hundreds of cores, which you could use. Um, and then you can program um, and implement stuff on those to work on those architectures. And CUDA would be the pendant uh, on NVIDIA's side. 
So it's uh, mostly a programming technique to describe computations on such specialized architectures. Um, and the idea is that certain parts can be computed on a GPU or one of those uh, special architectures really. Um, it can be used whenever you have data parallelism problems. That means you have to perform the same operation on huge amounts of data. So that means there stuff can happen in parallel because you have to do the same operations on a bunch of data which is usually linear algebra from mathematics, a graphics computation, some numerical applications, simulations. That, that's the stuff where you could use OpenCL and CUDA. Uh, yeah, and, and dimensional vector problems. The general idea is to copy data from CPU RAM to GPU RAM. You then call your graphics kernel. Graphics kernel is just another word, a fancy word or a fancy expression here for a function that runs on your device on the data, so graphics kernel runs on the data, and then you copy the result back from GPU to CPU RAM. Um, and one thing about those kernel functions that run on your devices, um, it's pretty hairy to get it right at first glance, because you have to somewhat use a different model of thinking, so it's uh, an entirely different mental model that you have to um, develop first of all and then also apply, because um, those graphics cards have so many cores and so many threads. It's basically like all of your computations happen at the exact same time. It's basically whoosh, one go, and then you have your data. Um, and this can be tricky to encode in program code, really. So also one thing is that branching must be avoided if possible because um, those accelerated special architectures, graphics card and uh, multi-core architectures are really good of applying the same stuff uh, to some data. So same operations on different data, but they're really slow if you need to do some if, else, because those processes have not been developed for that use. So whenever possible, try to avoid branching because um, if you branch too much, you don't get the performance benefits anymore. And then it would probably make more sense to just have your computation on a central processing unit uh, on, on an ordinary CPU, which is much faster uh, for branching code. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, I already mentioned that different model of thinking it uh, is uh, quite hard at the beginning. And so then also quite hard at the, at the mid uh, section. And then, yeah, it becomes somewhat clear at the very end uh, um, when you invested a uh, lot, lots uh, of time in, in that. Um, and the OpenCL CUDA stuff is uh, much more general applicable than the OpenGL because OpenGL is mostly for computer graphics only computation. And here with OpenCL CUDA, you can specify some arbitrary stuff um, which runs on your computer graphics card. What else do we have? We also have OpenMP, which will be quite interesting and um, very useful to you. Um, what is OpenMP? OpenMP is an API, Application Programming Interface, for shared memory programming in C, C++. We will learn what shared memory programming is um, in the next class. So in the next lecture, we will have a high performance lecture where we talk about all that kind of stuff. Um, OpenMP has been developed by hardware and compiler vendors. Um, it's a collection of functions, but mostly preprocessor directives for parallelization. And mostly you use OpenMP to parallelize larger loops. So if you have some for loops, for instance, that run over a bunch of data, and if you wish to make that step faster, what you usually do is you just provide one directive, one OpenMP directive uh, right in front of that loop. And th this tells the loop basically, yeah, here your loop do run in parallel. And then the um, loop range is usually split into multiple sections and distributed over multiple threads. Yeah, so basically a way to distribute computations on different threads. And you can also synchronize at certain places with um, o OMP, Pragma OMP critical, where you say this is a critical section, only one thread is allowed to enter that section at a time. Um, the great thing about OpenMP is that the program works correct, even if the compiler does not support OpenMP, because mostly it's all done in, um, preprocessor directives, 
which also means that if a compiler doesn't um, implement that, uh, it just ex ignores those directives and then the code would just uh, run sequentially. So every C++ programmer should probably know the basics because it's so easy to do stuff in parallel that um, OpenMP uh, yeah, introduces a term which is called embarrassing uh, parallel programs. So problems that are so easy to parallelize that it would be embarrassing if you wouldn't do it. Let's have an example here. Let's, impl uh, let's implement a small application. I'm also, let's use OpenMP here. Um, let's have a for loop. Let's have an integer, uh, let's have a vector of integer with, um, I can't read that anyway, so one, uh, 100 million integers, uh, which I initialized to two. And then let's have a for loop that runs over that vector and uh, takes each vector element times two. And of course, it, if the vector is longer and longer or has more and more elements, then of course this takes some time for the CPU to do it, to loop and uh, iterate over each and every element and take it times two. And then we print it uh, and you could parallelize that for loop here by just putting right in front of that uh, pragma, OpenMP, parallel for, you say, yeah, the integer, the loop counter is private. So each, each uh, thread should have its own portion of the loop and its own loop counter. Um, you wish to share that vector across all threads and the schedule should be static. That means that each thread gets uh, approximately the same range of that for loop. And then this loop runs in parallel. I mean, you can look it up on the internet how that works in detail. You can also try it yourself. So it's, it's really, really great uh, to use that. What else, what else do we have? We also have a library which is called Google Test. It's some kind of testing framework for C and C++. It also provides infrastructure for automated testing, <coughs> which is of great importance if you need to implement some larger piece of software. Um, then you just have to uh, write unit tests in order to check if all your functions um, work correctly and, and behave correctly. Because if you have a larger software system and if you at some point at, at once, uh, if you change one piece of that software system, it might be the case that another place in your software system breaks without you knowing about that. And that's really the worst thing that can happen. And by providing extensive unit tests where you test all your functions, you can then automatically run those unit tests and whenever you did a change to your software project, you can just run the unit tests again and see if everything still works fine and behaves correctly. If it doesn't, a unit test will fail and it will tell you what functionality is broke and then you can go ahead and fix those functionalities. So um, you cannot live without it if you have, um, if you need to implement a larger piece of software, you just have to use those tests, those so-called so unit tests. Um, yeah, can be executed, compiled and executed fully automatically. So you just have to type some commands to your machine and it will automatically compile and run them. Because I mean, what doesn't scale is if you run stuff by hand, so that doesn't work at all. You also get detailed information uh, whenever a test fails. It will give you the test name, the line number, and also the assertion that uh, failed, and then you can go ahead and fix that. It's also nowadays probably the de facto standard for uh, C++ uh, and uh, C testing, um, and it's used by many modern C++ projects. Um, first stable release was in 2016, according to Wikipedia. I'm not sure what people used before that. Um, hopefully they <laughs> did use something, but uh, probably some handcrafted solution. But um, yeah, again, Google Test provides a very nice way on uh, testing things. <coughs> <coughs> so how does it work? How would you use it? So usually a software system has, of course, at some point it has some main.cpp, which implements the main function. And then from main it, um, start solving your problem. Um, usually you have your project distributed into several source files. So that is um, related functionalities you declare in a header file and you implement in a respective um, implementation file ending on .cpp. 
and you have some more sources of course and your main then calls all the sources and makes use of them and um, describes basically um, a solution to your problem. And the idea of Google test is that for each implementation file, for each source uh, implementation, you have an additional test source, which usually has the same name as the source, as the implementation file, source one, and then usually you, you let it end, you give it a suffix test um, to such that you can immediately see uh, that's a file which contains unit tests. And also it's a CPAP file, that means this will also be compiled. And yeah, for each implementation file, you have also a separate test file. That's the general idea. Let's have some example. <clears throat> Let's have some easy example. Let's have um, the header file, which declares a function f. Um, then of course, we also have our impl ordinary implementation file, which um, of course includes our source file. And then we provide an implementation for that uh, function f. Then we have our main file, which uh, includes um, the header file here, source.h, which um, contains the header of that function f. So the compiler is happy here and knows uh, how to use that function f. And later on, the main file will be compiled and the source file will be compiled and the link of links together those object files. <coughs> and everything works uh, fine. So, and here is basically the additional test file, the Google test file that you have for the uh, source.h, source.cpp. Mm, here you would also, first of all, you would include gtest slash gtest.h and you also uh, include the stuff that you wish to test, f. And then using some macros, like uh, those are some test macros, you can then specify some tests. You can, for instance, I mean, this is, of course, a factorial function here. You can give it a name, a factorial test, and here it should handle zero input. And here you can um, basically describe your expectations. So you expect that f called with a zero, and here this f is really a call to that function f that you implemented right here. And you expect that f of zero gives you as a result a one, as a result. Yeah. You can write some more tests. So still the factorial test here, let's handle some positive inputs. So factorial of one should be one, factorial of two should be two, and so on and so on. So basically you call your functions and for each function call with some given input, you specify what output you expect. Basically you have some um, expected result pair and actual result pair. And the actual result pair is of course the call to that function. That is uh, what the actual result is. And then your expected result. Um, and then also you have a main. In that main you call a special function or two special functions rather, um, which basically run all of your test cases here that you um, specified in that file. And as you see um, that test file basically also has its own individual main function. That means that each test file here is compiled and linked with the implementation of the function that it's using. So this file would be compiled, this file would compile, and those would be linked together by the linker. <coughs> and then each unit test file um, is yeah, so called uh, is so to say uh, its own program. So the result of compiling a unit test here is a program which you can then run, and then the program basically will run all of your tests and it will tell you if some tests fail, and then it will give you all the information that you need to know to fix those error errors. That's the basic idea. If you need to look at, uh, I mean, you can look it up on the internet. It's really good. Uh, it's really well documented. What else do we have? We also have Google Upsize, the Google Upsize library. What is that? It's designed to augment the C++ SDL. So it's basically yeah, kind of an extension or it provides some, um, some more functionalities that can be used in addition to whatever the SDL already provides. Um, it has been crafted from a part or a collection of Google's internal C++ code base. So Google's entire infrastructure is built on a huge C++ code base. 
And the Google Upsize library is basically a collection of Google C++ code base. Um, it provides also various uh, library components to solve various tasks. Here is just a, a bunch of them. It, it provides much more. It provides uh, base functionalities. It provides um, algorithms, um, different kind of algorithms. It also provides some uh, really nice containers. Um, so containers different from the standard containers of the SDL um, and also some other SDL implementations and um, also functionalities for debugging and all that good stuff. And it goes on and on, uh, not forever, but uh, it provides lots more than I just uh, written down here. You can build the library using uh, the build system called Bazel, um, but you could also build it using CMake. It also works. And <coughs> Why um, why would you ever use maybe the Google AppSile library? Why would you, for instance, use the containers of the Google AppSile library? C++ has one large problem. And the problem is uh, that it's basically, um, yeah, as a requirement, it's, it's don't break compatibility. And um, one comp compatibility that you can't break is so-called application binary interface. So you need to be ABI compatible. That <coughs> is very important when you link stuff. So for instance, if you have an object file that you compiled with um, a C++ 98 compiler and you have that object file from 98, application binary interface, ABI compatibility means that if you compile um, a program nowadays, if you compile some stuff to an object file right now with a modern compiler, the linker must still be able to be able to link together the object file of 98 with uh, the object file that you just compiled with a modern C++ compiler. That is basically ABI compatibility, that you still must be able to link between uh, <coughs> different um, object files. And this also comes with a huge problem because it disallows by being compatible or when you wish to keep that kind of compatibility, you then disallow modifications and further improvements on SDL containers. Uh -huh. So that means you cannot just um, change the SDL implementation of vector because if you would change the implementation and the underlying data layout, it would no longer be compatible with the, the stuff that you compiled 98 or early 2000s or whatnot. Which is a huge problem because, for instance, the um, hash maps of the uh, C++ SDL library um, are now, nowadays quite old and there have been much better hash map implementations. And the problem is now we can't change really the SDL code because then we would break ABI compatibility. And here you maybe wish to use app sales container implementations because they might be much more or much more depends on your use case of course but they might be more efficient for your problem than the stl stuff that's also the point i mentioned uh, i meant at the very beginning so whenever you have an implementation uh, whenever you have a program that uses maybe an unordered map you may could improve your program by putting in an app sale container, which also provides various implementations of hash maps. As an example, um, that's my main point here. I guess we, we leave it there. Um, here's an example of the app sale library. So you would just include app sales and the string parts here, string components, which I have not even listed here. And for instance, the strill join.h file which allows you, for instance, to craft a vector of strings. And then you can say, yeah, take that vector of strings and join it with some other string. And then the join string would be uh, foo dash bar dash bus. That would be the very result. So that's uh, one very simple example, but uh, I just wanted to show some code here. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> libraries and the linker. So a C++ compiler will automatically link, link again C++'s SDL, the standard template library. Um, but whenever you need to link against an external library, you need to know some additional compiler switches, some compiler flags, 
which are not for the compiler, but rather for the linker. So I will now present to you three special compiler flags, which the compiler just uh, gives to the linker at the very end, such that the linker can make links again uh, between your own code and the library. Because, yeah, I mean, that's what the linker needs to do, right? It needs to resolve all unresolved symbols and needs to make links across um, all the program to create a final executable binary. So if you have a library installed on your system in one of the system paths where the linker can find it, you can use the dash lowercase l flag. The dash lowercase l flag is for the linker. The compiler will just uh, put a, give it to the linker, forward it to the linker, and directly without a space, without any uh, spacing character here, you give the library name. And then the compiler will compile your project, your, your code, and it will link against that library um, with the name that you specified after the dash lowercase l flag. Um, let's have an example. Let's uh, have an example. Let's have some code that makes use of the boost file system library. Um, here it does some stuff. And um, in order to make that code work, we not only need to compile it, but also we need to sp we, we need to tell the linker against what library it should uh, link. Namely, some of the boost libraries, probably because we are making use of uh, boost libraries here. So what you would do is you would uh, um, call the compiler. Set the standard, maybe set some warnings. You give it your source code. Uh, uh, let's assume that this piece of source code is um, in a file called test.cpp. You specify the output. The target program should be called test. And then you specify the boost components you wish to link against. So dash lowercase l boost underscore system dash lowercase l boost underscore file system. That means that the compiler will compile your program into an object file, it will link this object file against those libraries in order to produce your final executable called test. That's the main idea. If a library is not installed system-wide, that might also be the case. Um, many times you don't wish to install a library onto your system in, into all the system paths. That also works, but then you need to, to use two extra flags such that the compiler will be able to find uh, the library and all the files associated with that library. You have the first flag, which is uh, uppercase i, and then you give it a directory. Also, no, nothing in between, uppercase, dash uppercase i, then a directory's name. And this is a directory um, to the list of directories to search. <coughs> Just give me a second. <coughs> Okay. So basically here you specify the directory where the compiler should look for header files. Here we just use angular brackets and uh, stating that yeah please look just look in the uh, system header files. But if you have uh, your stuff installed in uh, a non-system wide uh, file you need uh, to give the compiler the include path where it finds the header files for uh, the library that uh, you do with uppercase i. And then you also, you give the library search path with uh, dash uppercase l, also you provide a directory. And this directory that you specify here is basically the directories where the linker should look for libraries, um, which can then be added by the dash lowercase l. Um, so this is the include search path, the dash uppercase i, the dash uppercase l is the library search path, and then the lowercase l is basically the library's name that you wish to link against. I believe we do have an example. Okay, <coughs> here we have an example. So let's assume for now that you have um, in a library which you installed in your home directory. So you have slash home slash my user slash my library. And my library basically comes with uh, the library and you now wish to link against that library. So what you do is you call clang, give it some standard, you give it some, uh, you enable some warnings. You then specify the include search path 
form my user my library include and then you special uh, you specialize or specialize you specify the library search path uppercase l home my user my library slash lib then you specify your source code that you actually wish to compile and then you specify with lowercase l the name of the library which is my library that's basically the idea um, you just have to get familiar with that um, so that means at some point whenever you need to use some external third-party libraries you will uh, need to use that um, but you can that's nothing maybe I mean at some point if you did it a few times you know exactly what you have to do um, you need to get used at the very beginning but uh, you will learn it uh, rather fast I guess so if you <clears throat> ever need to link against a third-party library after a few times you automatically know what what you need to specify here um, let's have one more example let's have a, a library structure let's have a directory called my library and in my library we have um, say an uh, another directory called include and in include we have another directory called my library and here we have our header files and in this case, our own library, called my library, only comprises one header file. And directly under the my library directory, we also can create a lib directory, which contains then the source code. So the implementations for the respective header files here. What I'm now explaining is basically the overall structure of a usual C, C++ library. So whenever you need to write your own library, you can um, <clears throat> you can, for instance, adhere to this uh, structure because that's the, the common structure of the C++ library. So you have a your library's directory, you have an include directory which contains the header files, and then you have a lib directory containing the implementation files. Let's have a look at the contents of my library. So let's have a function called add integer. So it's a very poor library. It only provides only one function, and the function is not very useful because how do we implement it? We implement that uh, my library to just implement, add, add, to just add um, two integers a and b. So uh, this is not a useful library, but just uh, showcase how you could do it. <coughs> and then, uh, then, of course, you have your source file, but maybe let's say you wish to create your own library from that. So what do you need to do in order to compile your library in a library? rather than just using the plain source code here. So first of all, the suffix for static libraries is .a for archive. So a static library is also called an archive file, ending .a. And then for dynamic libraries, uh, you have a suffix which is uh, .so on Unix Linux systems at least. And this is for shared object library. So I won't go into detail what's the difference between static libraries and dynamic libraries. If you ever need to know that, um, look it up on the internet. But um, it's at least important to know that there's a difference. So we have on the one hand, we have static libraries. And on the other hand, is we have dynamic libraries. Or maybe let me briefly try to tell you what, what the difference is. Maybe that's suitable. <coughs> if you need to know the details, look, look, look it up. Um, a static library is basically when you have a program. Oh, so may no, maybe let me start the other way around. If you have a library, like that one on the right hand side, my library, which doesn't do anything of, of use, but just assume for sake of priority here uh, that um, we wish to have such a library. We can now, first of all, we can, uh, one, basically one direction we can go is we can now compile that library into a static library, into an archive. And whenever you have a program then that makes use of that library and you link it against the static library, so you link it against the archive file, that means that the archive file, that everything in the archive file, the whole static library is glued basically to the program that uses it. So the executor, final executable binary will contain your application code and also the entire library code. <coughs> Static because it's all statically put in one blob in one executable. On the other hand, you can also compile this library here into a dynamic library. 
And what does it mean? Why dynamic? Um, the thing is now, if you have a program that uses this library, you can start your program and then at runtime, if your program calls something from that library, the library will be loaded at runtime dynamically. So the library will, if you have a shared object library, it will be dynamically loaded at runtime into the computer's main memory. And then uh, the function can be called. So it's loaded dynamically. This is why it's called a dynamic library. And, <coughs> and the benefit of a shared object of a dynamic library is whenever you have many pro uh, whenever you have many programs that use the same library, then the shared object library need only be once in memory. So you only have uh, the shared object library loaded once in memory, and then you can also have different programs all calling into the same shared object library. That's no problem. Whereas if you ever, uh, if if you, whenever you link against the library statically, and you have five programs that you run, and all those five programs link statically against that library, then you have five copies of that library in your main memory, really. Um, I hope that has been somewhat clear, at least for some of you uh, who are interested in that kind of stuff. If you haven't fully understood what I'm talking about, it's also no problem. You can look it up whenever you need some stuff like that here. <coughs> Let me quickly give you the commands that you can use to compile your own library. So when, uh, when you have such library, for instance, um, and you wish to create a static library from, from that, what you would do is you would compile, uh, first of all, you would, would compile your code into an object file using the dash uh, lowercase c flag. And then you would uh, call the archive program, which you give your object file, or you could also give it multiple object files, and then you give it the library's name, uh, libmylibrary.a, and this would be the, uh, the actual uh, programming library, the, the archive file. That would be if you <clears throat> need to produce a static library. If you need to produce a dynamic library, you call your compiler, you give it a bunch of sources, and you use the flags uh, dash shared in order to tell the compiler, hey, please uh, make a shared object library. And also you need uh, the dash f uh, pick code, uh, the uh, f pick flag, which means um, position independent code because uh, shared object libraries need to be compiled um, position independently because you don't know at runtime where in memory they will be loaded when you need them. Those are really technical details. So never mind if you did not fully understand <coughs> just for completeness. Okay, that would be pretty much it on libraries. Um, and now maybe let's talk the remaining slides, the remaining minutes, let's talk a bit about iterators. So what are iterators? Um, the idea again is simple. Uh, data is often stored in containers, right? So um, you usually not only have one variable, but in order to yeah, um, describe meaningful computations, you usually have uh, multiple pieces of data which you organize in a container. And oftentimes, um, in order to solve a given problem, um, a container must be inspected or iterated. You need to go over all of the elements of a vector, for instance. Um, yeah, and iteration of data is used all the time. Um, and a data type usually needs to provide some functionalities for iteration. <coughs> so when you craft your own data type, you must be able to inspect the elements, of course. Otherwise, your container would not be of much use, right? If you could just put things in the container, but you uh, could never look at them, um, that would be very unfortunate and not very useful. Um, the idea here is to uh, provide some ad hoc functionalities. I mean, uh, no, other way around, sorry. So first idea is, first naive idea is, yeah, just provide some ad hoc functionalities to inspect um, your own container. But then you have a problem because if uh, you do that for every container that you implement, every container looks different and must be also used in a different manner, which uh, is really um, tedious to, uh, to, to um, program in. So 
the solution is uh, specify a common concept called iterator. So iterators is uh, just a concept. And so what you do is you specify a concept called iterator that can or must be implemented then by your containers. What are the benefits of iterators? So here we have a nice uh, picture. So we, we have algorithms and algorithms operate on um, on stuff, right? They, they solve some stuff on, on a piece of data. And using templates, you can make the data types interchangeable. So templates make, make algorithms independent of data types. And iterators make algorithms independent of the concrete underlying container. So, <coughs> for instance, uh, sorting. Sorting, if you wish to implement a sort algorithm, you can first of all sort a vector of integer, a vector of double, a vector of, uh, I don't know, whatnot, of everything basically that implements the smaller than operator or a certain suitable binary predicate. Um, and that can be done with templates. We already saw that in the in one of the last exercise sheets. And of course, now we can also use iterators here, such that we can not only sort a vector of some data type, but we could also, for instance, sort a list of some type, assuming that both vector and list implement iterators, the concept of inter iterators. Um, so what are the benefits of iterators, really? So you achieve a higher level of abstraction and also a higher level of flexibility. Functions and algorithms can now be implemented using iterators. Um, they do not really care about the specific container they are operating on as long as the respective iterators are implemented. And um, you get also very much for free if you write yourself a container that implements the iterator concept. <clears throat> because, for instance, there is in, in the STL, as part of the STL, there is the header file algorithm. Um, and it says, you can find it on the cppreference.com website, uh, the algorithms library, which is basically the header file here, defined uh, functions for a variety of purposes, uh, e.g. for searching, sorting, counting, manipulating, that operate on a range or on ranges of elements. Uh, note that a range is defined as first, including, and last, excluding, where the last uh, refers to the element past the last element to inspect or modify. Um, so algorithm, uh, use algorithm rather than some handcrafted solutions. Um, algorithms also nowadays uh, specify in C++ 11, uh, C++ 17, an execution policy. So whenever you search or sort, you can um, uh, give it a policy, maybe sequence. You can also, what you can also give it another policy like parallel policy, such that it, it can run certain stuff in parallel. <coughs> So, um, iterators. Six categories of iterators exist. We have an input iterator, we have an output iterator, we have a forward iterator, bidirectional iterator, random access iterator, and a contig contiguous iterator since C17. Here you have all the iterator categories, and also here you have um, some. Um, Definitions, what, what they can or need to implement, basically. Um, whoopsie. And yeah, really, if you write yourself your own container, then you can see what, what your container needs to do in, in terms of iterators, and then you can implement that functionalities. So I won't show you any concrete examples how you implement it because especially for beginners, uh, implementing your own iterators for your own container types is sometimes not very easy depending on the uh, on how you organize the container. So <clears throat> I would uh, recommend to look those things up and uh, go into some uh, more detailed tutorials to see how iterators are actually implemented. Here I just present you how they are they work. So, for instance, you have um, in vector and all of the STL container types, you have some interesting functions. Like, for instance, you have begin. And begin is an iterator to the first element. Um, and we also saw that in the basic description of the algorithm header file. So, begin is an iterator pointing to the first element. 
and end gives you, if you call end on, on a vector variable, it, it will give you an iterator that points one element past the last element. <coughs> so one element past the last element. And also we have R begin, so for, uh, for reverse begin and for reverse end. Um, that's basically, those, uh, those are some special member functions, begin and end, so first and one um, behind the last. And then we also have the things for reverse. Um, and using begin and end, we can do some interesting stuff because, um, for instance, if we use the algorithm header file, we can, can do um, some stuff. We can use some algorithms here. So let's have a vector of integers, which we um, initialize with the std initializer list um, constructor. And for instance, what we can do is now we can um, check if all of the elements of a container uh, adhere to a certain predicate. So we can ask uh, the question basically, or we can call the function all of, then we give it a range specified by iterators. So vector of integers begin, vector of integers end. So basically iterate all the elements of vector. And then we give it a lambda function as a predicate <coughs> that is applied to each element in that container. And the predicate, or here in this case the lambda function, it um, checks for each integer if the integer is greater than zero. And um, this will answer if uh, all the elements fulfill the predicate here that you specified in terms of lambda function. You can also have any of, where you check if any of those elements adheres to the predicate here specified by the second parameter, which is a lambda function. You can count. So you can count how many sixes you have in your vector of integers, which uh, would be two. You could also have a multi set of strings. Um, you could then find some stuff. So you can find in the range of that multiset, you can find, uh, you can try to find the, the, um, the value world. And if it's, if uh, that find function returns something different than the end iterator, it will be, it is found, it found the element. If that call to the find function returns the end iterator, then it hasn't found any element um, that matches here your <clears throat> your search basically. You can also have a list of integers and you can also have a list, uh, you can also have a vector of integers. You initialize your vector of integers with the uh, size of the list here. Then you can use the copy algorithm which copies uh, all the elements from the list into the vector. So for each element in the list from uh, list begin to list end, start copying that stuff into um, vector of integers begin. So that's basically your output iterator, which now starts writing to the beginning of the vector until all elements have been written. You can also sort stuff. So already uh, the algorithm contains the sort implementation as well. Some more advanced copy stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess you get the point by now. So you also have set union and copy. So quite a lot of handy algorithms, which um, make your code usually much easier, much easier to write. And <clears throat> let's see how, how one could implement such a uh, algorithm here. So this is basically how an implementation of std find looks like or could look like. So you could um, have some input iterator type and you have some type of the element you wish to find. So the find function gets an input iterator or two input iterators first and last. Basically that's the range it should look or it should try to find an element. Here you give a const ref t to the value it should find. And if it finds something you, repair, you return uh, the input iterator. <coughs> so here you check for um, if the iterator that you dereference, because an iterator is basically under, hood, under the hood just a pointer. So you look for the element and check if it's equal to value. If it is, you return that iterator here. If you have not found it in the given iterator range here, you just return the last iterator, which is usually the uh, end iterator, which basically, yeah, points to one behind the last element. 
and this indicates that the element has not been found. That would be one example. Okay, so too good to be true. Um, yes, it's unfortunately too good to be true because here we have a few caveats about iterators. So first of all, iterators are really only pointers under the hood um, and pointers are very stupid. Pointers are not very smart. They just point to some, some memory really. And iterators can also be invalid and uh, there's nothing worse than working with an invalid iterator because it's undefined behavior right away and then you run into huge trouble. And I will give you two examples uh, on the next slides where uh, what using an invalid iterator can cause and so you have to be very careful. And yeah, usually if you misuse it, uh, it leads to unnecessary and time consuming debugging sessions. Um, <clears throat> You wish to always check if a member, if you use some member functions on some iterators, you wish to always check if the member function invalidates your iterators. Otherwise, again, you can run into huge trouble. So my recommendation is do not use member functions blindly whenever they operate on some iterator stuff. Read the documentation and read what those member functions do to your iterators. Otherwise, uh, again, you... Um, just spend uh, endless times uh, in debugging sessions. Uh, implementing your own iterators can be hard. It, it can also be easy. It really depends on the structure on the container uh, that you're implementing. For instance, um, if you implement your own vector container, uh, like we did in one exercise uh, before, uh, I, I, I forced you basically to, to implement your own vector, which um, allocated the memory on the heap. And for such a simple data type, uh, because it has a very simple structure, it's very easy to write your own iterators. But um, for more complex uh, containers, maybe you have, I don't know, uh, what could you have? Um, maybe some list containers or whatnot. Um, those are a bit more tricky. So the more complicated your container organization gets, the more complicated uh, implementing the iterators will become. So, and uh, this is also why I won't go into detail how you implement your own iterators. Just look it up whenever you need it. For most of the time, really, you don't need to implement iterators because, I mean, usually don't implement containers. You just use containers. You just use the existing SDL containers. You're just using the existing um, Epsil containers or Boost containers. And all those implementations come with iterators. Uh, so they implement the iterators for you. you. You just have to use them. So it's more of an exotic use case. <coughs> um, iterator bug one. So let me walk you through an iterator bug. Uh, look up member functions when dealing with iterators. That's my point here. So let's have a set C containing some integers. And now let's try to erase all the odd numbers from the set of C, uh, from, from the set C. So how we implement it here is we iterate um, from the beginning to the end. And whenever iterator again is just basically a pointer, the, the concept is only called iterator, but under the hood it's just pointers to memory, to elements of, of the container. So we dereference iterator to get the underlying value, same as, as a pointer basically. <clears throat> and then we check if um, we divide by two, we have a remainder of one. If we divide by two and still have a remainder of one, then, <clears throat> then the number, of course, is an odd number because it's not divisible by two without a remainder. And we now erase the iterator that we found, which apparently is not, uh, its element is apparently not divisible by two. We erase it from the set. So we use the set member function erase, give it the iterator and erases it. And in all other cases, if the number is even, we just increment the iterator. So and move the iterator one element forward, basically. That's what we do. And then <coughs> we try to iterate each and every element of the container. Here we are just using a range for loop. And if you compile that piece of program and if we run that piece of program, we run into such a crash. And the problem here really is the misuse of erase because the iterator that you give to erase is invalidated. Erase invalidates your iterator and the usage is wrong. So it must have been 
uh, C erase, you give it the iterator, then it removes the element that this iterator is pointing to, and then erase gives you, as a result, as a return value, it gives you the next valid iterator. So basically that means you need to replace this line here by the line I've written down here. And yeah, you, you have to look up how erase works. So look up in the documentation, it will tell you how erase has to be used. It will also tell you that the input, uh, the iterator here is invalidated and that it will give you as a result the next valid iterator. Um, so you need to look stuff up. <coughs> um, maybe let's give me another interesting iterator bug. Um, <coughs> vector of integers, easy. Let's reverse that vector of integers. So reverse is an algorithm and it just reverses your elements in the vector. You can also have an unordered map, int and string. Uh, from int to string, so it maps integers to uh, strings here basically. And let's call the reverse algorithm and uh, let, let us reverse the uh, range of um, begin and end. And then if you compile and run that piece of program, it will not even compile. So it will tell you, yeah, no matching function for, uh, no matching function for call to underscore underscore reverse. So it will tell you, it will give you a, a, a great error message here in terms of template errors and all the good, good stuff here. <coughs> So what's the matter? Check the stuff that you're using. That is my main point here. So reverse defined an algorithm. It expects as an iterator category, it expects a bidirectional iterator. A bidirectional iterator. If you look at unordered map, unordered map only implements a forward iterator, which is less than uh, by a bidirectional iterator, as you um, saw on the slides where I showed you the overview of what kinds of iterator types there are. So those do not match and then that is why the code fails and the compiler won't even let you compile that piece of code. So check your stuff. Templates do not carry type information, which is why you could write it, but then at compile time the compiler finds out for itself that the needed operations for reverse are not fulfilled and implemented. Um, that would be already it for today. So one more point is always be highly critical and suspicious. Um, here's a nice talk by uh, Felix von Leitner. Very interesting, very fun talk. Um, so it's not everything, uh, not everything is great about C++. <laughs> C++ also has some caveats. Um, and there's a talk, uh, a case against C++, so why C++ is bad for the environment, causes global warming and kills puppies. Um, here's a link if you're interested in that. Um, that's a very interesting, very critical talk. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not as bad as, as presented in the talk probably, but um, yeah, have a look at the talk if you're interested and um, make up your own opinion on that. Um, yeah, here is... Uh, a nice meme on C++. Uh, and so let's briefly, let's quickly recap here what we talked about today. So we talked about libraries, SDL Boost, Qt, uh, Armadillo, OpenCV, OpenGL, Vulkan, OpenCL, Cuda, OpenMP, Google Test and uh, Google AppSile and also about iterators, how they work, how, uh, how to use iterators. Um, and probably how not to implement them because usually you just wish to use uh, containers out of the box. Um, so writing your own iterators only makes sense if you need to write your own containers, which rarely happens, which is why I won't go into detail here. All right, then I would say see you in uh, this afternoon's exercise class. So next week we will, um, we will continue with high performance computing and parallel programming. So um, this lecture was today quite high level. I just gave you some pointers, throw some pointers at you where to find material um, if you need to solve a certain task. Next lecture, of course, will be more down to earth, how to use stuff. I will give you more detailed code examples. And um, so this is basically just an overview. This was basically just an overview lecture. And then next time we continue with high performance computing. 
After that, we will talk again, uh, not again, but we will talk about static analysis, which might be very interesting to you to get a better understanding for the compiler and how the compiler works. And then at last, we are already at the last lecture then. Um, in the last lecture, we will then talk about um, the final project, what you need to do within the final project. And also we will talk about some hacks and some miscellaneous stuff that might be interesting to you. All right, uh, see you next week then. Bye-bye.